And so there's a couple things I want you to know about me as I get started, is that the saying goes, you can please some of the people some of the time, right? And it's also true, you can offend some of the people some of the time. So I'll say, you're welcome, and I'm sorry at the same time. <laughs> OK, right, right, OK. So uh, I'm here to speak to you about the power of life. And I can assure to you, coming from the Great Plains, there is life there. You know, the flyover zone, sometimes I'm on the coast, people wonder if there's any life there or not, and there's plenty. Hope you'll come visit Kansas City and to Unity Village and enjoy the beauty there. So my specialty is um, metaphysics. I have a passion for Unity's metaphysics. I have a passion for the teachings. I have a passion for what, what might be called our, our theology, but it's more like a universal philosophy. So we're going to go on a romp. And one of the ways I like to start a romp is with my favorite affirmation. It's another beautiful day in my consciousness. Together? <laughs> another beautiful day in my consciousness. OK, let's do that one more time. It's another beautiful day in my consciousness. And so as I was, as I was preparing this talk, it occurred to me that um, most, most of the time when we're, when we're taught about how to teach and how to speak, that we should meet people where they're at, well, that's hard to do when there's this many people here. So what I want to invite you into is meeting me where I'm at. Now, that might be scary, OK? But open your heart, OK? Now, there's no requirement that you believe anything I say, though I am asking you to understand. So you have to, you know, we don't, and you know, we don't check our brains at the door. We bring our intelligence in. So I'd like you to open with your intelligent self, OK? Are, are we ready? OK. So I decided that I would share a little bit of my story, then a little bit about the metaphysical basis of the 12 powers. And part of that is to help you be on the same page as I am. Because as I travel the unity movement, we could say there are a multitude of flavors of unity. Yes? You know, we say we're new thought, but we're really any thought, in a way. <laughs> OK? Like, like, any thought will do, OK? And then we're going to get into whether you believe or know the 12 powers. And then we're going to share some about the power of life. You ready for that? OK, so my story. So this, this is a little self-revealing, so have some compassion. So I hated the 12 powers. I mean, flat out did not like the 12 powers. And that was all the way through ministerial school and to my early years of ministry. And then I was hired to be dean of spiritual education at Unity Village. And one of the courses that had to be taught was, yeah, the 12 powers. And I'm going, yikes. I don't know anybody who likes the 12 powers. <laughs> but we've had, we had a teacher there, Reverend John Anderson. He loved the 12 powers. And he loved teaching the 12 powers. So I was kind of off the hook. And then one day, he came in my office and he quit. Not good. And so. I sat there at my desk and I said, who do I have to teach the 12 powers? And you know what the inner voice said. <laughs> Don't you hate that? You know? And it's not insistent, it's just this quiet, it's yours. Now, the really cool thing that happened in conjunction with that is, as, uh, as one of my passion is uh, researching the writings of Charles and Myrtle Fillmore's, primarily the unpublished stuff, I was just getting a glimmer that everywhere I looked, they were talking about the powers, either in general or naming them specifically. And I had one of those duh moments, you know, where something dawns on you that's obvious. And it was like, oh, so the 12 powers were really important to Myrtle and Charles Fillmore. When I was taught, it was taught more like a uh, bump on the wheel, like we're going to teach this because there's a book. But no one was really, in my estimation, teaching them really well or really understood them beyond a, a surface level. So I put on my big boy pants, and I took a deep breath, and I went into the archives. And I said, there must be something here in the archives that support why Myrtle and Charles had the 12 powers as the hub of the teaching. Did you hear that? So when I was taught, it was like this 
bump on the wheel. But in their day, it was central. And the reason why it was central was, was that meditation was very important. Prayer was very important. And the 12 powers was all about how we regenerate Christ consciousness, how we raise our consciousness. And that wasn't being taught very well. So when I went into the archives and I found out that Charles's book was based on the 12 months of Unity magazine in 1920, I decided to read that magazine cover to cover all 12 months. And yes, Charles's articles were there. However, there were articles by other people that in some ways wrote more clearly. And I finally understood the 12 powers for the first time. And, and that understanding was based on getting a better understanding of the fundamental metaphysics. And in fact, in Charles's 12 Powers book, he says the 12 Powers is an advanced teaching. And it's advanced because it uses all this other stuff. So I'm going to start with some of the other stuff. You ready for that? Okay, this, there may be times here you're going to have to take a deep breath because you're going to maybe hear something different. Are you ready for that? Okay, all right. We're ready. Okay, so looking at the underlying metaphysics. Well, first and foremost is God is principle. You've heard that, right? And Myrtle said this, we are studying spiritual science to get a broader conception of God rather than holding to the view that God is a personal being with parts like a man, at which point she either giggled or winked, right? I can't imagine what she was seeing in her head. And then referring to that male-like God, a being subject to change and capable of varying moods, was that the God of your childhood? Yeah, so the God of my childhood was a man who lived some far place away called heaven, and was he ever moody? <laughs> Not that I had anything to do with that. And then she says, though personal, we have a personal experience of God, though personal to each one of us, God is it, neither male nor female, but principle. God is principle, okay? And then bless her heart, she tells us to refer to God as it, and then the rest of her book, it's God, he, God, him. <laughs> Go figure. And then Charles said this, so Charles said this, that God is mind, by the term mind, we mean God, the universal principle, which includes all principles. So this principle that we talk about, one power, one presence, that one power is one principle, and it contains principles. We could say it's an idea that contains ideas. We could say it's a power that contains powers. Got it? Okay. So these ideas that God, mind, principle, divine ideas, powers, they're all synonyms, okay? And we can even throw in Christ there for good measure. Are you ready for that? Okay. So Charles says, this was in Keep a True Lent, in every man or every person, the Christ or the word of God is enfolded. So that's where we get the idea, the Christ in you, right? It is an idea that contains ideas. Did you know that? That when Charles was referring to the word Christ, he was not refer referring to Jesus or an entity. He was referring to this concept that the Christ is the idea that contains ideas. We could say the power that contains the 12 powers, you with me, or the principle that contains principles. Okay? And that Christ within isn't in you like a wiener in a bun. Okay? Because we have this image as I travel the country that people see the Christ within as something within them, but somehow separate. So that that Christ, that idea that contains ideas, is enfolded in you. It's inseparable from you. And Charles Fillmore's favorite scripture was, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Did you know that? The Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I never knew why Charles liked that so much, because I was hearing it from my Christian ears. However, doesn't it make more sense if you say, the idea in me is my hope of glory. 
The idea that contains ideas is my hope of glory. And if we could name those ideas, if we could name those principles, it's more applicable. The Christ in me, my hope of glory, feels good, but it's pretty useless if we can't name what it is. And it's not that feeling good is wrong, it's just that we're looking at a practical way to make ourselves better, yes? Yep, and some of you know my favorite saying is, what happens in vagueness stays in vagueness. So Christ is kind of a vague term. It means many things to different people. So I want to share a little science with you here that's really interesting. So it's obvious we have a physical universe, right? And it changes. And there's also a changeable non-physical universe we call consciousness. Yes? Okay. Now, what, what science is telling us is that the physical universe, while it's changing, underlying is something that's unchanging, and it's made up of constants or principles and laws. Did you know that? Yeah. So this changeable universe is based on something fundamentally that not, cannot be seen or smelled or heard. That's unchangeable. And then scientists are finally willing to step their toes into the realm of consciousness. They've been kind of avoiding it because they don't know what to do with it. But now what we're seeing is that the scientists are beginning to, to kind of agree or lean in that direction of the people who develop new thought. That consciousness is something very fundamental. In other words, you can't go much deeper than that. And underlying consciousness are immutable, unchangeable principles and laws. And the laws tell us how to use those principles. So what we're really saying is, is that whether it's physical changing and non-physical changing, it's underlined by the same thing, principles and laws. And in unity, we call the principle that contains principles, we've given the name God, haven't we? At least based on what I just shared with you. You've got to take my word for it, or Chuck's, I don't know. So, and he's saying that those realm of ideas is the source of everything. So these, this realm of ideas is the source, the fundamental basis of everything. You, me, the trees, the stars. And then Charles goes on to say that man has all power and authority over all ideas of infinite mind. Did you ever even imagine that you have power and authority over the ideas, the, the principles of divine mind? Did you ever think of that? Because we're almost always taught that somehow they control us. And then Charles said this, the ego is man, and by reason of his divinity, so do you know you're divine? Not just you're divine, darling, you know, but that you're actually divine. You are, you are the divine. And then he goes on to say, well, so I'll just start over again, by reason of his divinity, he makes and remakes as he will. Do you realize you are making and remaking yourself every moment of every day? You're doing that. And that's one of the radical and wonderful things about unity, about self-responsibility. Someone else isn't responsible for your consciousness. Someone else is not making you or remaking you, in case, just in case you didn't know it. Okay? And we're using our divinity to do that. You're using your divinity to make and remake yourself. And then he goes on to say, in this lie his greatest strength, yes, and his greatest weakness. Has anybody ever created something not so great in themselves? Yeah, right? It's sort of a universal experience. And it's one of the ways in which we can learn. And guess what we're using to create either the greatest or the worst? Principle. Because that's the only raw material we have. And then Charles goes on and just puts it right in our face. God is the one principle. We are all as free to use God, the one principle, as we are free to use the principles of mathematics or of music. Wow. Most religion teaches God uses you. 
Charles is 180 degrees different from that. And then there's this quote, which I discovered in the archives because I was trying to find out, I was curious, why in 2006 or 2007, as I look back over time, it seemed like we were not getting the same results from prayer as Merle and Charles reported in their time. Have you ever wondered about that? And so I was looking at what's missing today. And so I went to the archives and I found out there was this healing conference in 1923, the first healing conference ever given by Unity in Kansas City or anywhere. And in his very first lesson, this is what Charles said. And this to me, friends, is the missing piece. God only does what man says he shall do. All the prayer, even the affirmative prayer I learned, was all about asking God to do something. This says I have to do something. You see the difference? It's huge. God only does what man says he shall do. God is our servant. Okay, when I first read it, I was waiting for the lightning to strike. To be honest, okay? Did you ever think of that, that this wonderful spirit of God out of which everything is made, is here at all times, is always present with us, and we are using that God? That whole concept of using God is foreign to many, many people. However, let's look at this exact same quote using Charles' definition of God. What's Charles' definition of God? God is principle. Then we get something very reasonable and understanding. Principle only does what man says principle shall do. Principle is our servant. Have you noticed that? That if you're using the principles of electricity, they do what we say. Even when you get bad results, they just do what we say we, they shall do, right? Did you ever think of that? That this wonderful principle out of which everything is made is here at all times, is always present with us, and we are using principle. I share that with you because the 12 powers are principles. The 12 powers are divine ideas. They're just waiting for you, in a sense, for you to use them. Because they do not have the capacity to use you. Charles said, there is but one power. You say that here, right? There's only one power and one presence. And when I read that and said that for years, it was like, there's only one power and one presence in the universe in my life, God, the good omnipotence, and I'm not it. Did anybody read it that way? Because I can read that from my old theology. And we got to remember when we say there's only one power, that means the power you are, the power you are, the power you are, the power you are, must be that power. Because if your power has a different source, now we're in a duality. There's not one God. There's not one principle. You see? And this teaching is about a non-dualistic system. So he says, there is but one power. We use it as we will. If we send it out by our thought and word and hate, it destroys. I've noticed that. Have you? But if we send it out in love, it builds. There are not two powers, but two ways of using power. Okay? And that power contains powers, which we're calling the 12 powers. So those 12 powers are right there. You see them. You, you've looked at each one for the last 11 weeks. But um, do you believe them or do you know you have them? So let's check. You ready to check? Okay, so here we go. Here's the answer, yes or no. Do you notice you have the ability to believe? Do you notice you have the ability to persevere? Do you notice you have the ability to compare and contrast? Do you notice you have the ability to desire and harmonize? Do you notice you have the ability to master and control? Do you notice you have the ability to imagine and visualize? Do you notice you have the ability to understand? Do you notice you have the ability to choose? Do you notice you have the ability to adjust? Do you notice you have the ability to be passionate? Do you notice you have the ability to renounce or eliminate? Do you notice you have the ability 
to vitalize and energize. So you just prove to yourself that you have these abilities. And the abilities are what we experience when we're using the principles or powers we call the 12 powers. You get it? So it's not, I believe I have faith. You know you have faith. It's not, you believe you have the principle of life or are the principle of life. Okay? You know it. You've experienced it. And mostly we do it unconsciously. And so what the teaching about the 12 powers or the 12 principles is about becoming conscious of those principles so we can use them consciously and hopefully better. So let's talk about the 12 powers in general. We already just noticed, we, at least everyone in this room has them, right? Okay. We are always using them. You cannot not use them. All the principles there are, are always in play and available at the point of view to use. And they don't care how they're used. They simply are. They can be overdeveloped or underdeveloped. Overdeveloped elimination is throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And we explore them individually, not because they are individual and separate, we, we, we explore them individually so we can understand them better and then learn how they really operate as kind of a team. Okay? So, let's look at the power of life. So, we're going to start with the Apostle Judas. The really, the most important reason to know the Apostle associated with the power is because when you're doing metaphysical Bible interpretation, when you're interpreting a scripture and Judas appears in there, that represents within you your power of life. And whatever Judas isn't doing in the scripture, that's something happening in your consciousness around the power of life. And this is one thing Charles said, the Judas faculty, the sum of the unredeemed life forces, is bound to betray until it is spiritualized. So Charles chose Judas not because of the good side of life, the good good use of the power or principle of life, but because of the downside he demonstrated. And then we talk about location, location, location. They're in the generative organs. They were more genteel in those days. Anybody know what the generative organs are? <laughs> yes, we do, okay. That's something I didn't dare put a picture of. <laughs> I do want to be invited back, okay. And it's the color red. Right? Color red, and that's why you're seeing a lot of us with red today. Yes, with red. Blood is red, and we connect blood with life. Yes? Okay. So Charles said that, no, Myrtle said this, and then I have the Charles quote, God is life, we make life into a living. That's what we affirmed in the meditation, right? I am life, I am living. And to get from I am life to I am living, I use the principle of life to produce Living, and this is what Charles said. God is life. Life is a principle or a power or a divine idea that is made manifest into living. And life is our ability to energize, vitalize, enliven, and invigorate. And just think of everything every day you're energizing and invigorating without even thinking. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So we want to do it consciously. And it's used for animation, activity, action, and vigor. And then, this is a paraphrase, the immutable principle of life that is the basis of all energy that propels all forms to action. Many people when I travel say, God is love, or God is energy. That's a very popular one, God is energy. Anybody know that one? God is energy. Well, God is not energy It's what we experience is energy in this relative realm because energy changes and principle doesn't change. So life is the principle that is used to manifest all forms of energy that we experience in the universe. It underlies everything. And it's the principle of life that energizes and activates all the other powers. So when we use life from sense consciousness, we're using it based on our senses, thoughts, beliefs, and feelings. So we're using life 
in a way that's from a lower level of consciousness. It's not that sense consciousness is bad. It's sense consciousness, we, we, we lead ourselves astray where we're not remembering sense and keeping our eye on our higher nature as well. And so this is an example that Charles says, the selfish use of the life and vitality of the organism for the gratification of sense, pleasure, robs the higher nature, and the spiritual man is not built up. All he's saying there is, when you use the principle of life purely from sense, you decrease your possibility of raising your consciousness. And then he says, life is not intelligent. Okay? The principle of life is not intelligent, but your life, life on the planet, which is a different use of the word life, is intelligent. Because when, when I'm talking about my life or your life, the life that you're manifesting is not simply being manifested from the principle of life, you're using all the principles to manifest yourself. Okay, so, so there's life in the general picture, and then there's this life that's the very principle that all of that is manifested from. So we need to use our powers of understanding and wisdom. Understanding and wisdom. I, I didn't listen to the talk from Kristen, but we say the same thing about the power of love, that love, love runs amok if it's not used in conjunction with wisdom and understanding. It goes astray. And then I want to share a little bit about principle and law, because uh, if we didn't have law, we couldn't use principle. And in fact, one of the definitions of God as law is principle and action. And friends, for years, I read that in the Revealing Word, and I didn't understand what it meant. But as I've done some research, it's gotten clearer and clearer that, that these, these divine laws, like the law of mind action, is dependent on principle in order to operate. So the law of mind action, anybody know, hear of that? Yeah, the law of mind action says, thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. Paul Hasselbeck's version is, thoughts held in mind with feeling produce more thoughts with feeling of the same kind. So when we hold a thought in mind with feeling, it grows in our minds. Have you noticed that? Yeah. So when we have an angry thought, if we hang on to it and it has feeling, it grows and expands until we stop that trade, right? Okay. And so when we're holding on to a thought with feeling, we're giving it life. That's what affirmations are all about. We're giving it life. We're using the principle of life. And when we're holding on to that thought with feeling, we're desiring whatever seed thought that is in the moment, whether it's a good one or a bad one or an ugly one. But when you hold on to it with feeling and you're really desiring it, you're using the power of love, the principle of love. So you can see when we use the law of mind action, we're using the principles of life and love because we've already learned that anything that changes is based on principle. And then when, you, when we use life from a higher perspective, from an elevated consciousness, more based on our clearer awareness of these divine ideas or principles or powers, we get a better outcome. And hopefully that's in the direction of raising our consciousness or regenerating our Christ nature. So, are you in the game? Do you want to raise your consciousness? Do you want to regenerate Christ consciousness? Well, one way is we do an affirmation, so let's start. So it says, I use life wisely. Okay, that was lovely. Now let's say with a little more energy. I use life wisely. Okay, now you're going to use your dominion center, okay, your personal authority. Now say this with authority. I use life wisely. And now let's say it with zeal. I use life wisely. I see you do. Thank you for being here.